I am Sarah Chapman, and I am the executive director of the Media Burn Archive, which is a nonprofit based in Chicago. Media Burn collects, produces, and distributes documentary video created by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. Um, just letting more people in. Um, this event is part of an ongoing free series called Virtual Talks with Video Activists, which create conversations surrounding the way that media production can, sub can spark social change. We're so pleased to be presenting this event in partnership with the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. And I'd like to thank Professor Dan Morgan for his assistance in coordinating the event. Um, today, we will be presenting and discussing clips from four videos by Franklin Lopez. Um, our moderator um, is Stephen Charbonneau, who is Associate Professor of Film Studies and Graduate Director in the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies at Florida Atlantic Un University. He's also the author of Projecting Race, Post-War America, Civil Rights, and Documentary Film, and co-editor with Chris Robay of Insurgent Media from the Front, a Media Activism Reader. Um, so I am thrilled to turn this over to Steven, who will get us started. And just um, for everyone who's listening, um, definitely stay muted while we are um, showing the videos. Um, but once we start the discussion, feel free to put your questions either in the chat or by unmuting yourself and just talking because we'd like it to be very conversational. So whichever you prefer, but for now, stay muted so we can all hear. And um, yes, please, Steven. Okay, thank you, Sarah, so much. And uh, hello, everybody. It's um, an honor to be here. And I just want to say it's my pleasure today to introduce Franklin Lopez. Um, Franklin Lopez is an anarchist filmmaker who has produced hundreds of videos and short films with Submedia, a website he's been associated with for many years. He's well known, of course, as the stimulator and host of It's the End of the World As We Know It and I Feel Fine. You have to say all of that. Um, it's his political web news comedy series. And it's been described as by Chris Robay in his book, Breaking the Spell as a Crowning Achievement, quote unquote. But um, Franklin's work is more extensive than this and includes all sorts of music videos, political documentaries, uh, remixes that center core interests around indigenous rights, anti-capitalism and eco-activism. In 2011, um, Lopez toured the world with his feature film and Civ and screened it in over 150 venues in 18 countries. And this was this film was partly based on Derek Jensen's radical environmental writings. And in 2013, he produced Street Politics 101, a documentary depicting street actions that took place during the Quebec student strike of 2012. And more recently, he has focused on documenting resistance movements that seek to disrupt the flow of oil and gas and other natural resource extraction from within indigenous communities and territories. Uh, in particular, these films feature the struggles of Wet'suwet'en First Nation peoples to protect their land from the Canadian government and multinational corporations hell-bent on installing oil pipelines and engaging in other extractive practices uh, on their land. And so these works include Stop the Flows, Choke Point, How to Stop Oil and Gas Pipelines, as well as Invasion. So Frank's work um, is extensive, it's exciting, it's hilarious, it's politicizing, of course, and it's unique, I think, in that it reflects a personal vision. You always have a sense of um, Lopez's work behind it, but also there's a collectivist spirit, and he's inseparable from, I think, the wider movement of anti-capitalist, radical anarchist media today. So just without further ado, it's an honor to introduce Franklin Lopez. And so, um, Frank, if you wanted to say a few words and introduce um, the clips we're going to see today. Yeah. Hi. And uh, thank you so much uh, for that awesome intro. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank you so much to the Media Burn Archive uh, for for um, for creating this space. Uh, I came across the the archive uh, through through the Radical uh, Film um, um, Network's uh, email list. And I am a I'm a VHS head. I I I love. Uh, all this all this archival stuff i love seeing like all the activist videos just to show that there, there was like a a very vibrant activist video activist scene before the internet um and um i i kind of i my work kind of comes at, at at the tail end of like that that pre-internet uh, uh video activist scene and it's so cool to see like this important work of archiving that stuff. I can't say it enough. Like, I mean, uh, so much stuff gets lost. A lot of, a lot of, act, a lot of activist stuff from posters to music to whatever is so eph ephemeral 
that I really appreciate that that work, uh, and I hope that you all can keep doing it. Um, so, uh, like Stephen said, uh, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, as an anti-colonial person, I like to acknowledge that its its first name is Borique. It's this uh, Taino name of of the island. And Puerto Rico, for those who don't know it, is a it's a U.S. colony. It's uh, probably the oldest colony. Uh, if you count like the 400 plus years that the that the uh, uh, Spanish had it, um, and a lot of my work is sort of uh, comes from from that lens, from the anti-colonial lens, because I grew up uh, with an anti-colonial in an anti-colonial family as well, um, and it's no, I guess it's no accident that I ended up making political films, much to my dad's chagrin. Even though he's really much involved in politics, he would have rather me like be a business matter some other shit. But anyway, um, I started in uh, making films in my teens and and then making political films when I was in college. But what I really wanted to to do uh, uh, in my twenties was to make music videos, and uh, that didn't really pan out. Uh, and in the early two thousands, um, uh, some friends kind of pointed out that, "Hey, man, I think you're an anarchist, and here's a book and read it." And and I read it, and I was like, "Holy shit, you guys are you guys are right." And then that's when I decided to throw away any sort of prospects of a respectable film career and dedicate myself to, to doing anarchist propaganda. Also very inspired by uh, the anarchist films of the late uh, 1990s and the early 2000s uh, around the anti-globalization movement really were the things that showed me that this was possible and really gave me a kick in the ass to do it. So I uh, have much gratitude to those folks for, for doing that work. And um, yeah, so in 2003, I made an anarchist film called uh, Join the Resistance, Fall in Love. And from there on in, like, it's just been downhill. And I, I just want to show you a little clip from the second anarchist film I made. It's called Why I Love Shoplifting uh, from Big Corporations, inspired by a text from uh, by Crime Think. Nothing compares to the feeling of elation, of burdens being lifted and constraints escaped, that I feel when I walk out of a store with their products in my pockets. In a world where everything already belongs to someone else, where I'm expected to sell away my life at work in order to get the money to pay for the minimum I need to survive, where I'm surrounded by forces beyond my control or comprehension that obviously are not concerned about my needs or welfare, it is a way to carve out a little piece of the world for myself, to act back upon a world that acts so much upon me. It is an entirely different sensation than the one I feel when I buy something. When I pay for something, I'm making a trade. I'm offering the money that I bought with my labor, my time, and my creativity for a product or service that the corporation wouldn't share with me under any other circumstances. In a sense, we have a relationship based on violence. We negotiate in exchange, not according to our respect or concern for each other, but according to the forces that we can bring to bear on each other. Everything changes when I shoplift. I'm no longer negotiating with faceless, inhuman entities that have no concern for my welfare. Instead, I'm taking what I need without giving anything up. I no longer feel like I'm being forced into an exchange. And I no longer feel as if I have no control over the way the world around me dictates my life. I no longer have to worry about whether the pleasure I received from the book I purchased was equal to the two hours of labor it cost me to be able to afford it. In these and a thousand other ways, shoplifting makes me feel liberated and empowered.
The shoplifter wins her prize by taking risks, not by exchanging a piece of her life for it. Life for her is not something that must be sold away for seven or eight dollars an hour. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry. Uh, I swear to God, I'm not a cat. Um, so um, I hope you like that. Uh, and I should say, it's quite a feat that we, we could actually do this stuff. Um, but uh, all those films are on my former collective's website, uh, sub.media, if you want to watch them in its entirety uh, and uh, at a better quality than what we can stream. Um, but uh, yeah, after after I made that film, uh, uh, I miraculously got hired uh, as, a, as a producer for, for Democracy Now! And I did a short stint there, um, producing the, the news show over there. And um, But a, after I left uh, Democracy Now! and moved to Canada, um, I really enjoyed the, the news making aspect of it. Um, and I, I really felt that there was a lot of news that were not being covered uh, by, by really anybody, you know. And particularly, I really, all, and I still had this, this sense that the, the activist scene, like, especially when it comes to media creation, uh, uh, lacks a sense of humor. I, I really, there's nothing I wish more if, the, if more activists were creating uh, uh, funny stuff, you know. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, you know, I, I, I thought I was kind of funny and I was just like, okay, I'm going to make a new show the way I would like to make it. Um, and I, I kind of ripped off a, a character from a really bad movie called Johnny Mnemonic. And I created this this avatar called the Stimulator, and I decided uh, that I wanted to to really yell at politicians, just be really foul mouth, and 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 really like experiment, you know, with the internet and 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 how to reach audiences using all kinds of different technology, including uh, video podcasting. Uh, back then, it was, there was an application called Miro um, that was uh, was fairly uh, awesome for for reaching people. Uh, uh, with video podcasts, and this is all pre-YouTube, or at least YouTube had just started uh, around that time. And uh, and I had a lot of fun with the show. I, it, it, in fact, I had so much fun with the show that I did it for 10 fucking years. Um, and uh, it really uh, it really opened a lot, of, a lot of avenues for me, particularly like networking with other activists and really meeting activists from all over the world. Um, so I'm really thankful that, uh, that, that it, you know, that it's the small audience was like hardcore enough to like one. It's like, it's when I started, like I quit jobs, I quit doing uh, uh, video editing for hire. Um, and even though my earnings were meager through, through crowdfunding, which back then was, was new, um, I was able to make it happen. So, uh, you know, after a couple of years of, of doing the stimulator while doing other jobs, I actually quit and, um, and started doing, uh, you know, full-time work, uh, just doing some media stuff. Um, so this next uh, uh, video I'm gonna show you is just like a little a little clip from one of my favorite episodes of uh, It's the End of the World, as we know it, and I feel fine, and it's called uh, Countdown to Armageddon. Vandalism is vandalism. Destruction is destruction, whether it's of lives or property. It's not acceptable. What do you think of the Boston Tea Party? I thought it was wonderful. It's the end of the world as we know it. I feel fine. Good morning, slaves, and welcome to another edition of It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine. Because sometimes you gotta fucking laugh. <laughs> I am your host, Stimulator, and yes, it's definitely feeling like the end of the motherfucking world. Scientists say 2012 gave us the hottest year on record so far. As a result, polar ice in the Arctic has been dissolving at an alarming rate. Scientists say Meanwhile, the two fecal dwellers who are competing for the position of corporate doggy style I've been completely ignoring global I will fight to create more energy in this country to get America energy secure and part of that is bringing in a pipeline of oil from Canada and with respect to this pipeline that Governor Romney keeps on talking about we've 
created, we've built enough pipeline to wrap around the entire earth once. Oh, fuck it. Who gives a shit what these corporate meat puppets think? Well, the motherfucking Texan resistance doesn't. And for the past three fucking weeks has been choking the oil supply to the corporate death machine. An intrepid coalition of troublemakers bypassed the NGO industrial complex and put a stop to the Keystone XL pipeline, a giant metal cock hose that aims to bring grimy oil from the motherfucking tar sands to refineries in the Gulf of Mexico. The monkey renters have been having a ball playing hide and seek with the planet wrecking oil technicians. But it's not all been fun and games and some peeps have been arrested and others have come close to serious injury. These folks are asking for other wily hellraisers to join them in the forest. But if you can't make it to Texas and have a couple of bucks to spare, visit tarsensblockade.org. Keeping things on the apocalyptic zone, Zionist commander Ben Netanyahu used complex visual aids to describe the allegedly sophisticated Iranian nuke catapult that threatens the apartheid state of Israel. But seriously, and I am not making this shit up, this is the best fucking graphic that this good-for-nothing racist could come up with? Where should a red line be drawn? A red line should be drawn right here. Actually, I think we should draw a red line right here. To simplify the amount of blow you must have been doing when you thought this whole thing up. Speaking of peace, guess who got all that dynamite money for keeping things chill this year? The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2012 is to be awarded to the European Union. Are you fucking wangoing my tango? I just had to get to the bottom of how this laughable gold medalist got chosen and tracked down Tom Jangler, hemp rock out the Novel Boom Duquets. Yo, Jangle. <laughs> Were you on your fucking pea smoking rock before deciding? No. Yep, I am convinced. It is the motherfucking end. But no end of the world party will be complete without plenty of food and drink for your homies. But if you're a broke ass like me, all you have to do is follow the example of some unions in Spain who have been rolling up 20 deep into corporate supermarkets during business hours and straight up gangsta looting stores and ganking snacks and munchies for hungry peeps. But the Spanish are not only hungry for food, they are hungry for blood. Pig, Pig blood, blood, that, that is. is. This was exemplified by the anti-austerity protest last month, when peeps surrounded the parliament in a massive show of fury against the slave masters. The following day, the streets of Athens were on fire, literally. A general strike mobilized thousands to Syntagma Square, where the familiar yet always inspiring battle between the anarchists and the fuzz ensued. Yo, Tape Ninja, go ahead and play the Athens riot porn. It goes by many names, but it's a very simple, a very effective, a very destructive weapon. There's every reason to believe that it will be used much more often and much more effectively. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's only appropriate that uh, that's sort of looped around to uh, Greece, uh, because I've been following what's happening in Greece since, uh, since 2008, um, and and mostly you know like most anarchists out there just falling in love with like the the valor of uh, of folks out there and when as steven said like i toured the world uh with my film and and one of the last places i visited was um 
was Athens. And uh, it, it was truly mind blowing to see what a place with a large group of very organized anarchists uh, can do to to how a place feels uh, in general. And so when I wrapped up my tour, I decided to visit Montreal. Uh, I had heard so many great things about it. And while I was on tour, there was a student strike happening. Um, and, uh, and I knew about it mostly because I had friends who were telling me about it. But the reality was that the student strike um, wasn't really known outside of Quebec that much. Uh, because most of the media that was created around it was uh, being created in French. Um, so when I when I finished the tour, I, uh, I, I went to Montreal at the tail end of that and I started talking to people about it. And one, two things happened. It's like one, holy shit, like Montreal had a bunch of fucking anarchists. And I was like, I can actually move here. I, I have uh, I have permanent residency in Canada and I'm being priced out of Vancouver. So I needed a new place to live, so I decided to to move to Montreal, really partly based from my experience in Athens, uh, really not wanting to be a minority or a very tiny minority anymore. I really wanted to be a, a, around a lot of people who had the same political affinities as I did. Um, and uh, on my on, in the process of moving to to Montreal, I uh, I decided to make a, a short documentary in English, uh, so that other people could benefit from from or could learn about this incredible student movement uh, that essentially had uh, a six month insurrection in Montreal um, that really like depleted the budget of the police uh, the, and also the morale of the police and brought the government, the government of Quebec or the province of Quebec to its knees. So I'm gonna show you a little piece from uh, Street Politics 101 and I'm gonna go to the bathroom. <laughs> a lot of people, talk about the strike as a demonstration strike. I mean, in, in French, it's a grève de manif or, or something that happened in the street rather than uh, in occupations or, or in, in some kind of uh, production of critical theories or whatever. There was a lot of mobilization actions every day, demonstration every day and blockades and economic disruptions. On March 7th, students blockaded the Quebec Lottery Building, which houses the Conference of Rectors and Principals of Quebec Universities. By this time, you can see students wearing masks to cover their faces, and the masses seem less intimidated by police batons. The police uh, response was very harsh, and uh, a grenade exploded in the face of one of the, the student protesters there, and that marked the imagination of a lot of people. And it was like one of the first time for many, many people that they see like how far it can go with the repression and all the result of like a demonstration and stuff. So it was really a shock. The student was Francis Grenier and he lost vision on his left eye permanently. That night, the anger on the streets was palpable and the students were calling for revenge. The people was uh, more younger uh, than uh, before, and also the other pe uh, people like the parents, the old people, and the younger, uh, the two, they came to uh, support more uh, the students, and they, they saw what was the uh, brutality uh, from uh, police, and uh, I think the uh, students and other uh, social society, they mobilized more uh, hardly after this uh, situation. The timing of this unfortunate event couldn't have been worse for the Montreal police. That was maybe 10 days before the March 15 demo, the International Day Against Police Brutality demo. It really created a context where all the pieces of the puzzle were there to make a, something happen. Anarchists have been organizing this demonstration for the past 16 years but this is the first time a massive influx of students took part. This is partly due to the membership of the class voting to endorse the rally. This was also the first time during the student strike that other issues were highlighted, not just the tuition increase. Maybe for the first time for a lot of people realize that police brutality is not an abstract concept. It's not just something that we raise every March 15th to make a ruckus or make trouble. It's a constant factor that people have to deal with in their lives, mostly vulnerable people, marginalized people have to deal with police brutality and police repression. The mayor pled with students not to join the anarchists on this day, 
but the event was heavily promoted, and a publication entitled Blockade, Occupy, Strike Back was widely distributed. The zine was a practical guide for militant actions and occupations, which included tips on masking up, building barricades, and security. From the beginning of the strike, we saw the use of masks go from being an isolated practice to something that became normal for hundreds of people to do, which helps to open the space for conflictuality because people feel they can fight back and get away with it. This explosion in the use of masks wasn't magical. It took anarchists consistently masking up and explaining why they mask up in flyers and conversations. It was quite impressive, these images of uh, writing that came right after this provocation by the police. It, it kind of gave a, a new tone to the, to the student strike. It was important to, to show that uh, we won't let the police beat us, uh, just do what, what they want with us and that we'll stand together and we'll fight back. Yeah, um, so yeah, I know it's like we're, we're running a bit of time and I'm sure that we want to have a little discussion. So uh, th the last thing I'll say is, uh, is that uh, I'm going to show you a piece of invasion. Uh, uh, Stephen talked a little bit about uh, uh, my work with the Wet'suwet'en, um, but I, I have to say that uh, and I, and I always like to acknowledge this. I, I lived in the States, you know, all my life until until I moved to, to Canada um, 15 years ago or so. And um, I found that, uh, well, when I moved to Canada, I, it's really where where I learned a lot about indigenous resistance and, and, and the anti-colonial movements of North America. Um, and maybe it was just like in the world that I was living in, but like, like you know, for when I lived in the States, like indigenous resistance and in, in anti-colonial politics, like really were, were, were really limited to like Leonard Peltier or conversations of, of him as a prisoner. And, and the activists in, in the West Coast of, of so-called Canada were, were, have been really influential in politics that now permeate, like, you know, that go down South. And um, a lot of this stuff um, really came, came, came to a big crescendo during the anti-Olympic movement, uh, uh, opposing the 2010 Winter Olympics in, in Vancouver, that they had the slogan, uh, no Olympics on, on stolen native land. And I had, I was just coming into the scene like around that time and I met some incredible indigenous activists. And, and then through my work there is how I got to know people in Wet'suwet'en and they invited me up to their community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Wet'suwet'en, uh, especially since uh a lot of these news don't really make it down south but like like right now like like right now we're we're celebrating a pretty important anniversary of some shit that happened last year but i'll tell you after you watch this film to give you some context and then and then we can have a discussion thanks you're trespassing on the third of Remove us forcibly from our lands with your rifles, with your semi-automatic weapons. Nothing has changed in 150 years. keeping our eyes on the planned demonstrations across the country, all in support of anti-pipeline protesters in British Columbia. 14 people were arrested at the protest site late yesterday. That sparked a stand of solidarity across the country. Rallies were staged in dozens of cities, even some in the U.S., in support of the anti-pipeline protesters. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could face heat over the issue tonight. He's in Kamloops, B.C., hosting a town hall. Trudeau has made improved relations with Indigenous people a core priority of his government. Um, you in the striped scarf. Yes. Hello, my name is Tilly. 
I come from the Statium Nation. I want to ask you, what are you going to do to stop oppressing and holding our people under um, your, your colonization? When are you going to give us our rights back? When are you going to start giving a shit about who we are as people and not seeing us just for our land? I believe that the conflict that you're making it into out west with helicopters flying overhead and, and paramilitaries showing up with assault rifles is uh, appalling. And so I'm more or less here to tell you that that's shameful. What you did to the Unistoten, that's a national disgrace. Shame. January 7th was a, was a national disgrace of Canada. Yeah. It's inspiring to see the support worldwide that we have and it's not just our indigenous people that are standing up, it's people all around the world are concerned about the environment and concerned because they know it impacts them no matter where they live. So yeah, with that injunction and such low numbers out here, all of the Wet'suwet'en chiefs, because of what happened at 44, we're afraid for us that we're still up here at the camp and they didn't want any of us to get hurt. So out of fear, they made their decision to get us to stand back. And we made a decision that we not, it was too demoralizing that we weren't gonna take down those gates. If they wanted them down, they had to do it. This is my people's land way before the settlers came here. And you think you have a right to come on our land and destroy it. It's not right. My people have history here. The partners that have signed, they have no history here. And I hope you can go home and sleep tonight. We started coming back here in 2009 when we wanted to put a cabin here and realized that we safely could drink this water, so this became our prime point on where we wanted to spend more of our time. This is the proposed corridor for multiple pipelines and we decided to move out here because we realized we couldn't protect our territories from afar. We're two hours away and because they kept on trying to come in. Who are you? My name is Rod. Where are you from? Chevron, representing the Pacific Trail Pipeline Project. We're here today because we'd like to do work on the territory, and we're requesting access to the territory here today so that Wet'suwet'en people can work and see the benefits from our project. We've already said no to these projects and that no pipelines will come on our territory, and we only have two territories left out of all our territories because of other people occupying our lands and agriculture, municipalities. All we have left is two areas, and this is one of them. We hunt, we fish, we trap. This is our critical infrastructure. So what you're telling us is that you will not allow us access onto the territory. We understand that. We thank you for your time here today. We the brought you an offering. Again? We've left some water, some uh, tobacco. No, we thanks. Bring. We've got clean water right there. That's what we drink, and that's pollution, the plastic that adds to the landfill. Um, so if, if people want to watch that whole film, uh, it's online. Um, just gotta go to onestotten.com slash invasion and I'll make sure I'll put it on the, on the chat and, um, did I do that right? Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, 
a couple of years ago, I left some media. Uh, I decided I was um, kind of burnt out. <laughs> I really loved the project, but uh, I think it was time to like to 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 move things to that that were a little simpler, uh, that were beyond uh, pretty much doing everything: uh, video editing, doing promotion, stuffing envelopes with T-shirts, sending emails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I just you know kind of like focus more on the craft and. But I really had no plan other than I, I know, I knew and I know that I, I want to do an education project. I'd like to pass on some skills uh, specifically to communities uh, in resistance. Um, but around that time that I was taking a break, uh, two filmmakers, uh, Sam Vinyl and Michael Toledano, who have also been uh, supporting the, the Wet'suwet'en uh, for a bunch of years, uh, approached me about making a feature film project about them getting all of our collective footage together from the past 10 years and, and making a, an epic film. And I said, hell yeah, let's do it. But we wanted, we wanted to see how we worked together. And uh, at the time, Frida, who you saw on screen, uh, wanted um, a film that uh, would show what it, what, what it was like uh, to be in the territory after the, the, first, the first invasion of 2019. And so we, we made that film, Invasion, um, and we put it out and, and that was like November of 2019 when we put it out. And then in February of 2020, like around this time, like right before the pandemic, just, just, just made us forget that there was a world before the pandemic, uh, they were invaded again. And this time the reaction from activists and allies and accomplices and indigenous structures all over Canada was more than just to do uh, demonstrations. They started blocking railroads. They started blocking highways. They started blocking ports. They started blocking um, uh, the border to the United States. And essentially, they blocked. They they locked up the economy of Canada for almost two weeks. This was like national news every single day, and it really forced the government of British Columbia and the federal government to talk to the Wet'suwet'en. And, and while that struggle is is far from over, like the, the the pipeline company has continued to to invade the territory, has continued on in, in their plans to to build that pipeline, the resistance continue, and uh, and uh, it's just you know it's just a, a wait and see 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 how see if, if these folks uh, and 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 their allies and I, I put myself squarely in their their allies uh, corner uh, can stop this 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 company from. Uh, not just uh, invading somebody else's territory, but like, you know, setting the first um, pipeline in what could be like uh, the biggest carbon corridor in North America that would basically bring tons and tons of carbon into the atmosphere uh, through through a proposed uh, oil and gas ports in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, yeah, so with that said, uh, I'm down to chat with y'all. Oh, and I have to say, like, I saw that Dee Dee Halleck was in the audience. Holy fucking shit. Hi, Dee Dee, if you're still there. Thank you for coming. It's a huge honor to have you in the audience. So appreciate that. Well, Frank, maybe I'll start it off a bit. And do you want to say a little bit about allyship and the relationship with the indigenous peoples that you're making these films with and how that came about? It sounds like you've been working there with the Wet'suwet'en for a while now, so there was already a relationship there. You know, sometimes that's, anyway, I just wanted to say a few words about allyship and. Yeah, uh, it, it it was, I was I was just starting to, to tour with NCIV and, and uh, um, I got this invitation uh, to go to the territory to show the film uh, in a few places. The folks there were, relocating from the reservation or the reserve as it's called here in Canada back to their land. It was the very, very beginning of, of, of their camp. And, um, it was, it was a massive honor that they wanted to show that film in particular because the subject matter was pretty radical. Um, um, and, uh, and in a sense that they were, they were taking a stand in terms of how, where they wanted to be politically. And I hope I'm not speaking for them, but you know, the, the film makes a huge, um, critique of the, of NGOs, environmental NGOs, including Greenpeace and others. And so, you know, they were essentially saying like, that, that is not the way we want to go. And, and so it was not just like, let's show the film. It was also like, bring, bring some 
comrades up with you and like let's start strategizing towards the future about what we want to do here with this resistance and so it's it was i mean it's hugely informative for me um you know i came into activism late in my life but um it allyship uh it's something that i don't like i don't i mean i like i like the term accomplice uh, more than ally i like to say that i'm in cahoots uh, with the folks there uh rather than just being somebody who 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 takes orders or whatnot. I think a lot of a lot of people, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we have to take direction from the people whose land there is, but, it, but you know, we also want to be like on par with them and, and, and give our opinions and whatnot. And that's the relationship that I've had with them. It's like, how, how can we work together and how can I, how can I put the things that I know how to do in, in at your service and, and, and further your struggle. Uh, but in the end, like we're, we're all in this together. And I think that those politics have um, have has spread uh, massively, and I, and I think that uh, we've seen how that has sort of played out in the states as well with Standing Rock, and now with Line Three, uh, and, and other anti-colonial struggles, even even in, in, in Louisiana and the uh, in the Bayou, um, and. Uh, I, I, I can I really highly recommend uh, a zine by uh, an indigenous activist and anarchist, um, uh, Klee Ben Ali. It's called Accomplices, Not Allies. If people have not read that, I, I highly recommend it. It's free online. People should just search it out. Uh, so not that, you know, that didn't come out when I started doing this stuff, but I, I certainly like read it and I can nod my head that that's a lot of what Klee's laying out there is... Um, it's something I, I really agree with, right? That, you know, we we should not just be passive uh, actors in this whole thing. We, we really should like get our hands dirty and, and take risks and uh, because there's so much at stake. Thank you. Anybody else want to share comments or questions? I just, uh, it's strange to see all this stuff after three days of uh, the uh, invasion of the Capitol and to see the, you know, the p burning of the police cars. And I, I think I have a different take on that now. I mean, you know, like four days ago, I would have said, yeah, right on, you know. <laughs> And uh, it's kind of, it makes you think about all these structures that uh, somehow um, are uh, actually are how a lot of evil gets perpetrated, but also how fragile they are. And um, phew, it's, uh, it's difficult. The ending was, it was going on the same time as Frank came on was reading of Thomas Paine, uh, the crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. And he changed it actually to men and women's souls. So anyway, it's worth taking a look at that uh, Thomas Paine pamphlet that really um, made a lot of the stuff that we take for granted possible. But um, also, there, there's so much bad history, and uh, we are on Indian land. What can I say? Yeah, I, I think that one of the most mind-blowing facts that I learned about Canada coming up here, um, you know, addressing your we're in Indian land uh, point, Didi, is that... Um, most of Canada has never had a treaty with indigenous nations and in Canada inherited their laws from England. Um, and one particular one was a was 17, 1769 Royal Proclamation, I, I believe that's the year that said that King George basically said like, no, no, nothing can happen on indigenous land without their consent. You know, it has to be treaty. And so like the whole area is known as British Columbia. That's mm -hmm. never, it's, there's never been a signed piece of paper. There's never been anything that says that that's part of Canada. And the Wet'suwet'en took Canada to the Supreme Court in the 90s, spent millions of dollars 
and they won. They actually won and proved that they hold title. They're the title holders of that piece of land that's about the size of New Jersey. And even with Canada Supreme Court, they still don't give a shit. They're still trying to jam a bunch of pipelines through a territory, mm. you know? And so sort of to circle back around, <laughs> you sort of wonder, you know, we, we, we're, we're told that, you know, we're a system of laws, we're a, a fucking democracy and it's all bullshit, you know? And in Canada, there was a, it was a major event that happened 26 years ago. It'll be 26 years this July. It's called the Oka, so-called Oka crisis, where Mohawks um, took up arms to defend the little tiny piece of land they had left, like close to Montreal, like called Ganesatagia, a mm. reserve over there, because it was not enough for the town of Oka to have a golf course right on their right on the on the on, on the border, but they wanted to make it an 18 golf course, and in order to do that, they had to take over the Mohawks cemetery. They mm. wanted to bulldoze the cemetery. And so they, they was like, they had enough. And so they called out the warriors and they had a 78 day standoff and, and, and they, and they succeeded. And so a lot of things that are, that are happening in Canada right now has to do with people getting tired of this idea that, you know, we have to follow the rule of law. We have to follow this democracy. We, we, we gotta be peaceful because it just doesn't fucking work. You know, we saw it with George Floyd all last summer. I hope people don't forget that, even though it was just like half a year ago mm. and uh and people here are at a breaking point you know as uh mm. indigenous folks have the worst conditions of any population in canada and they're the smallest minority worst mm. water conditions suicide uh education i mean you can just go down the down the down the line and 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 folks are just they're, they're, they're just ready to burn it all down and you know and i support them you know Apparently, George Floyd is going to be the Republicans' answer to the Trump. They're, they're editing together all this footage from Black Lives Matter protests last summer. So It's predictable. <laughs> Very predictable. I should also say that my kid might show up from daycare at any point. So it's the, the, this illusion of like burning cop cars behind me might be broken by a four year old <laughs> at any moment. So, Frank, do you see in the arrangement of clips you presented to us a kind of, I don't know, an arc or um, uh, artistic evolution of any kind? I don't want to project that onto it. I just wonder how you see it, you know, in your eyes. Uh, you know, it, it's like everybody else, like everybody's like, it's really damn busy. <laughs> and I was just thinking to myself, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what the audience is going to be, but, but I definitely wanted to show, yeah, for sure. Like a, like a trajectory, uh, of how I get from point A to point B. And there's a lot of missing parts in there. I mean, I've made like 500 videos in, in the past at least since I started uh, this trajectory of anarchist filmmaking, like in the early 2000s. So there's a lot of things in there that, that, um, that are missing, but, but for sure, um, uh, my politics have evolved to, 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 a, to a certain degree. Uh, but now I'm, I, I would say that I'm more concerned and I want to, I want to spend more time uh, dealing with, the politics of, of marginalized communities and people of people of colors and indigenous folks, um, just because they not enough people are, are putting attention into that. And, 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 you know, coming from like a, a colonized place myself, um, it's, it, I definitely feel like a lot more affinity there than in other struggles. And so I, so sort of understand that, you know, I don't know if, People. I made a film about this island called Vieques. It's like one of my favorite places in Puerto Rico. Um, and the Navy took it over 65 years ago and, and just started bombing the fuck out of it for, for 60, you know, all, all the way to the year 2000. And so I understand what it's like to, to, to see places that you love uh, being destroyed by people who are not from there. And so, and so I think that's, that's really what's pushing like the, the work that I'm doing 
yeah, these days. And thankfully, some media is still there to cut up right. riot porn, and I can get my fix like that. <laughs> Got to acknowledge my colleague and good friend Chris Robay has posted a comment in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can see it oh, yeah. or not. He, he's asking, how has your work changed, if at all, in light of changing technological platforms and even younger generations as viewers? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think one of the most challenging parts of sub media was uh, uh, always trying to do to adapt to that, you know, like when I, when I started uh, doing the stimulator, the main platform was like video podcasting. So I was like really hoping that that people sign up to the RSS feed and downloaded the video. And then, you know, sort of migrated to YouTube. And in the final year, it's like actually our main platform, like where we got the most viewers, like was like, was say Facebook, and it, it sort of becomes exhausting. And, um, and it's and it's not that I get that I've given up because a lot of the a lot of the 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 things that the techniques that that we that we have developed as as video activists over the years are still you know they still apply to things like TikTok and other and other platforms and such, but I I really think that that, that the pace of change is is it's a bit hectic uh, for me like I'm not really. I am, uh, I'm a family person now. Uh, I clock out at five. I, I don't have uh, long nights where I'm trying to figure out like, like the newest, greatest things. And I think that that should fall on, a, on younger people. And younger people have a better, I mean, I really feel old saying this, but younger people have, have a really better handle on, 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 the, on how these things work. I, I think that the thing that that bothers me the most about the new technologies is, is how ephemeral everything is and how everything sort of gets lost and how people produce things to be, to be put on a platform that might not exist in like a year or two. I'm, I'm massively obsessed with, uh, with archiving, uh, and, um, and, and keeping a record of things. And, uh, and so for sure, like, I'm a lot of like I think I what the type of work that I want to do right now is like I want I want to create work that, that that stands the test of time, but also try to pass on the knowledge of like how the a lot of the work that 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 we were doing at Sub Media was focused on on mobilizing folks, and so um, I I hope that that doesn't get lost uh, in the sort of barrage of, uh, of 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 videos and and videos that we had to compete with, but. Alas, I just to go back to, to Chris's question because I think I'm rambling a little bit. Is is uh, I I I really if I go, if I'm going to create something, I want to I want to see it like last and not and not be like something that just becomes a blip and uh, and, and disappears. And so I'm doing something very different, and I'm 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 making projects that take a long time to make, uh, which is kind of cool. Mm. So you think that f feature films is the way to go, Frank? And I noticed, I I was thinking that one of the main, the most important uh, videos that was made by the video freaks in Chicago was uh, Fred Hampton's video, which is now being made into a feature film, which I heard people raving about that it's oh tom doesn't like it <laughs> but i it's interesting like what what what's the difference between the way you approach making your feature film and 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 just recording things and having fun with it yeah so to answer your first question i <laughs> i don't think feature films are the way to go um i think they have um they have a strength, you know, they think that they can be really good uh, um, uh, tools. Uh, you know, when I think about, um, I was talking about the Oka crisis, like there's a fantastic documentary. It's one of the best documentaries ever made about indigenous resistance. It's called Ganasetagi, 270 Years of Resistance. It's for free on the National Film Board's YouTube page. I highly recommend it. Um, and so that, that documentary is super useful, like uh, to, to show people like, what can be what can what can be achieved um but i think that a lot of like right now for the wetsuotan like we're trying to make this feature film at the same time as supporting them and 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 keeping the 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 attention of the world as much as we can on them and so if we if we decided 
that you know making this feature film would be more important uh there 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 could poss possibly not be like a, a resistance or, or several resistance camps in that territory because we took those media resources away from something that needs help now to create something that needs help later and so it's like a chicken and the egg thing but but the reality is like a lot of the success of the what Suetan has come because of all the media that has been created and it's not that i'm taking credit for that because there's a whole bunch of different people involved uh we're a pretty big committee of, of folks but uh the feature film will be useful in the in the long term but i think that uh it will be amazing if more professional or quote unquote professional filmmakers will spend more time supporting projects in the now um and and i understand people need to eat and people need to pay the bills and and all that but i think also the world is burning and i think the 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 breathing the air and drinking the water and and defeating global warming is it's definitely more important than careers and i and i mm -hmm. think that um i think a lot of people have been captured by that by that whole career thing and and i think a lot of people have made great things but um i I think that when I look at the media uh, uh, sphere right now, there's so much media being created. We're competing against so much that you know we could use all hands on deck, all the expertise that we could that we could get to support the movements that are that are happening at, at this particular moment in time. So I think this might be a good stopping point. I know that Frank's kid might be showing up soon <laughs> and you gotta go do that but this has been a great conversation and i know a lot of people join late and so if you missed it we're gonna post a recording um in a few days so it'll be on mediaburn.org and also um again check out sub.media to see a lot of these films in their entirety videos in their entirety um and someone just requested um some some links to a lot of the stuff we're referencing so when we post um the, the this recording we'll try to make sure that it's accompanied by direct links to a lot of the the videos that were referenced so that everyone can find them easily so um thank you so much to steven for moderating to franklin for being here and showing us all this great work um to levi for um do, handling all the tech uh dan morgan for helping coordinate um this at university of chicago and yes please join us in two weeks um we will have julia lesage um thursday the 25th at i think 6 p.m central um possibly check our website to make sure that time is right um and um yeah it's been great spending an hour with you all see you later hey, thanks thanks everybody <laughs> thank good you night. frank it's great thanks sarah thank you levi thanks thank everyone you. thanks chris good night <laughs>